Veronica, thank you for that. That was a blessing. Let's pray. Precious Jesus, thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath. Thank you that we can worship you in assurance that because of your sacrifice on Calvary, our worship can be acceptable in the sight of heaven and the Father. Lord, as we open your word and as we have this um, sermonic time of our worship service, we pray that the Holy Spirit would attend to our hearts. We thank you for hearing us and answering. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John 19, verse 5, tells us kind of the culmination of the mockery that had been hurled upon Jesus there in the last hours of um, his life before going to Calvary. John chapter 18 tells us that Jesus was in Gethsemane with his disciples, and you know the story. One of his closest friends, Judas, betrayed him for money. And then he's led away, he's arrested, and he's taken to Annas, whose father-in-law was Caiaphas. And just something to consider, Annas and Caiaphas were very conservative Jews. Just a caveat, a thought, that conservatism is not conversion. And so Jesus was taken from Gethsemane to Annas and Caiaphas. And while he was being questioned and mistreated, Peter denies him in the courtyard. And then Jesus is taken to the high priest and he's questioned again. Then Annas binds him and sends him to Caiaphas. And it's a back and forth. Farce of a trial after farce of a trial after questioning. And if you look closely at the four gospel accounts of Christ's last moments before Calvary, you'll find that there are seven of these trials, these mockery of a trials, that Jesus endures. Where he's ridiculed, he's spit upon, he's mistreated by the soldiers. And then, of course, Peter denies him not once but twice. Then we get to John chapter 18, verses 28 through 40. We won't read those entire verses, but Pilate is before Jesus. Or I should say Jesus is brought before Pilate. And Pilate begins to question Jesus. And eventually, Pilate is led to ask Jesus the question, What is truth? Pilate is impressed by Jesus. He's impressed by his humility, by the way he carries himself. And Pilate, for a moment, is considering what is truth? In that moment, Pilate, his eternal destiny hung in the balance. And we know that he was unfortunately pushed over the edge by the enemy of all men. And he went ahead and he acquiesced to the popular demand of the people. And instead of losing political position, he decided to do that which was politically expedient for him. And he has Jesus beaten and scourged. We pick that up in John chapter 19, verse 1. And we'll read these five verses, so I invite you to follow along with me in your Bibles. John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. He whipped him, had him whipped. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. They were mocking Jesus because the question or the claim was that Jesus was the king of the Jews. And Pilate had questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? And he was. But 
you and I know the soldiers really thought that was funny. And so they mocked him by putting this crown of thorns on his head and clothing him in a purple robe. Now they didn't realize what they were doing. But nonetheless, that did not make their cruel deeds any less culpable. But what they were doing is by putting that crown of thorns on the head of Jesus, they didn't realize it, but unwittingly they were actually telling the salvation story. Because the plan of salvation always was to place the curse of sin, the curse that, was, that mankind had been infected with in the Garden of Eden, where Adam would no longer be able to um, work the soil without thorns and thistles growing. Now, this very crown was made of thorns, which emblematically showed that the curse of sin was being placed on Jesus. The soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Verse 3, and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. It's quite a picture. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Well, Pilate was conflicted. He didn't find any fault in Jesus, and he wanted to release Jesus, but he also wanted to be politically favored. And so he did that which the middle ground, you know. By the way, in today's culture, everybody's always talking about take the middle ground. You'll find in the Bible there's rarely a middle ground. I'm not endorsing extremism, but if you think that in any way that you can somehow be neutral in a time of crisis, Spirit of Prophecy says there's nothing more hateful to, Jesus, to God than to try to remain neutral in a time of spiritual crisis. And you and I are tempted to be neutral in the midst of crises because somehow we think that we can get off, get away from, rather, um, commitment to the one side or the other. And so Pilate is in this position of neutrality. He's trying to be neutral. He's having Jesus beat, but then on the other hand, he's saying, I find no fault in him. And he's trying to kind of encourage a release of Jesus. Pilate is what the Bible calls a double-minded man. He's interested in Jesus, but he's also interested in his political prestige. And so what won out? His own interest. And so in a conflicted manner, Pilate brings Jesus before the mob and he says, Behold, I, f I bring him forth to you that ye may, f may know that I find no fault in him. And then just imagine what Pilate says next. It, it kind of is the height of confliction and mockery. He says, Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man! With emphasis. It's mockery. It's interesting to consider this effort to kind of almost be humorous or to be trite. Behold the man! In the midst of Pilate's confliction, he is interested in Jesus, but he wants his political position. He wants to please the people. And then he just turns to humor. Behold the man! God help us not to hide behind humor. Humor is good. Don't hide behind it. Pilate told the mob to behold the man, <clears throat> but you see, you and I know that Jesus was more than just any man. There was more to Jesus than the mere human eye could see. Only the spiritual eye could see who Jesus really was. Number one, 
The Bible tells us that Jesus was the man who lived before he was born. No other man can say that, correct? John 6 tells us that I am the bread of life who came down from heaven. How many people can say that? Can Mohammed say that? Can Vishnu say that? Can the Brahma say that? No one can say that except for Jesus. Jesus, as we behold the man, Jesus was the man who lived before he was born. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 1, <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things that were made were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So, as we behold the man today, Jesus Christ, let's not forget that Jesus is our divine creator. He lived before he was born of the Virgin Mary. He is our creator. He has always existed. The prophet Micah tells us in chapter 5 verse 2 of Micah that Jesus, speaking of Jesus, his goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now there is unfortunately discussion and argument in the Seventh-day Adventist Church right now with some leaders. Not very prominent leaders, but some names that if I told you, you'd say, oh, I know that name. That there, there's a debate and an argument that Jesus had a certain beginning. And um, look, the Bible says that Jesus is from everlasting, okay? So when Pilate said, behold the man, let's understand who we're beholding today. Jesus, the Christ, the man, lived before his incarnation. He is our creator. And I submit to you on this beautiful Sabbath day that we worship Jesus as our creator on the Sabbath, not out of some dry formality and duty, but as a reminder that Jesus is our creator that he created everything in six days and he rested on the Sabbath. That's good news for us who need new hearts created in us. In other words, that's all of us. Jesus has the power, the creative power, to create new ways of feeling, new ways of thinking in us. By the way, your character is comprised of two things, we're told, your thoughts and your feelings. <clears throat> Aren't you glad? That Jesus is the creator, the one, the only, who can create a new heart in you, a new mind in you. How does he do it? By speaking forth his word. So yes, behold the man, but behold the man as Jesus Christ, the creator. Number two, Jesus Christ was the man who died that others might live. Mark chapter 10 verse 45 tells us the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. Hallelujah. He came to save his people from their sins, that would include us, and the Bible tells us that all have sinned and that the wages of this sin is death. Therefore, all need to be saved by Jesus Christ and his wonderful love and mercy. You know the verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is why Jesus came, to seek and save that which was lost. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. So it was on the cross of Calvary that Jesus paid the redemption. He paid the price for every single person who ever lived, including you, including me. From creation all the way to the close of time, the price has been paid. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is sad that many do not know about this. 
And if they do know about it, they don't really value it in the grand scheme of their priorities. Many others will not accept it through through a a perverted value system. But to all who accept him, Jesus gives everlasting life. Acts 16.31 tells us, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Can it be that simple? Yes. It was on the cross that Jesus paid the redemption, the price for our sins. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us the simplicity of salvation, the simplicity of Christ is 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life. As we take part in the communion service this Sabbath, we show that we have let Jesus into our hearts. And he who has the Son has life. So yes, behold the man. Behold the man as your creator, but also behold the man, Jesus Christ, as your redeemer. The one that paid the price to buy you back from slavery to Satan and sin. You're set free. We're set free. Number three, Jesus was and is still the man who lived after he died. Notice the Bible record, Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. The most mighty occurrence that ever took place was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The cross of Calvary, I should say, the whole, that whole weekend of events of salvation's culmination, that Christ is crucified, Christ is on the tomb on the Sabbath day, and he's resurrected on Sunday. This mighty occurrence of the resurrection changed the entire course of human history and brought hope to the entire human family. You and I, we grieve when our loved ones die, don't we? But we rejoice when we know that they go to sleep in Jesus because we have the hope of the resurrection. And so, you know, coming in in contact with mortality, or we're all mortal, but coming, being confronted with mortality is a really good exercise to help us remember the brevity of this life. It's short. Anybody here in your 40s? Can you believe you're already in your 40s? And I can say the same for the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, and I've talked to people, and you're like, I can't believe it. I'm already 70. I mean, I feel like I'm still, you fill in the blank, right? This life is like, and all of a sudden we're old, and we're like, what happened? I, I used to be young. Tui Pittman wrote this book. It's, it, it, get it if you can. I used to be young. Now I'm old. It happens quickly, right? But we grieve not as those who have no hope. We have the hope in Jesus Christ of the resurrection. And so our goal is to help our family, help our friends give their heart to Jesus. In the span of probation you have, three score and ten, or by reason of strength, four score, that's ample opportunity, the Lord sees, that you and I can choose to follow Jesus or not. We recommend following Jesus, amen? Because Jesus is the man. He's not just any man, he is our creator, the one that can create new hearts, new minds. He's the redeemer, the one that purchased us back, not on discount, not on a blue light special, but by the price of his own blood. And not only is Jesus the man, our creator, the redeemer, but he's also the life 
and the resurrection. And by the way, do we have to wait until we die and wait until Jesus comes in the clouds of glory to experience the power of the resurrection? Paul says in Romans 6, he says, those who are planted together in the likeness of his death will be raised together in the likeness of his resurrection. Beloved, how often are we crucified and planted together in the likeness of Christ's death? Paul says, I am crucified in Christ. He says, I die daily. So if you want the power of the resurrection available to you to be an overcomer, then make sure that in your devotional time in the morning, recommend early, plant yourself together in the likeness of Christ's death. You go and pick up your cross daily and be crucified. Crucify the flesh. You say, well, I can't do that. You can with Jesus' help. We can crucify the flesh with Jesus' help. Those who are planted together in the likeness of his death will be raised together in the likeness of his resurrection. And I submit to you that that's not just in the last trump, but that's right now. We can have the power of the resurrection right now. Pen of Inspiration tells us it's as much, if not more, of a miracle to transform a sinner to a saint, to bring a person from a child uh, um, to, to, to live the carnal nature, to become the divine nature. The new birth experience, the true conversion experience, it's as much a miracle for that to take place in a person's life as it is to raise a dead person back to life. Aren't you glad that this man, Jesus Christ, the righteous, the one that was being mocked and spit on, the one who was placed, who received the crown of thorns on his head and robed in a purple robe and mocked as the king of the Jews, as Pilate said, behold the man. That he's not just any man. He's your creator. He's my creator. He's our redeemer. He's our life. He's our resurrection. Jesus, the man who crossed the boundaries of the universe, who stooped low and came down to our lowly estate of humanity, not on loan, but given to the human race, forever our older brother. To Mary in the garden, Jesus said, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. John 20, verse 17. One afternoon, Jesus led his disciples out to the Mount of Olives near the little town of Bethany. There he gave his followers his last bit of instruction. He told them, <clears throat> while the, <clears throat> and, he, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight, Acts 1.9. Paul declares that Jesus, the man, is now at the right hand of God and he unceasingly lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. So, yes, behold the man, Jesus Christ. He's not only your creator, he's not only your redeemer, he's not only the life and the resurrection, but he ever lives to be your intercessor. He's your high priest who stands between you and the Father, and he makes you acceptable before the Father. He ever lives to make intercession for you. He's praying for us, he's praying for you. Aren't you glad? Lastly, Jesus Christ is the man that came down from heaven. The man that will soon be seen by every human being, every eye. For Jesus promised, I will come again. The prophet exclaimed, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Revelation 1.7 the bright rocket <clears throat> booster exhausts its propulsion. It sends men and women into space. But this power and this great glory that rockets produced are nothing when compared to the glory that we shall see when Christ comes at the second coming. Luke 9.26 tells us, For he will come in his own glory 
No borrowed glory. For he will come in his own glory, the glory of the Father and the glory of the holy angels. What a day that's going to be. How thankful we are for such a wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today as we participate in the communion service, the emblems of Christ's broken body and spilt blood, let's behold the man, Jesus Christ, as our creator, as our redeemer, as our life and resurrection, as our intercessor, and as our soon coming king. What do you say we behold Jesus afresh and allow this wonderful reality to transform us into his likeness. I want to read to you something in closing here. <clears throat> it's in reference to beholding. By sin, the image of God in man has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It is the work of the gospel to restore that which has been lost. And we are to cooperate with the divine agency in this work. And how can we come into harmony with God? How shall we receive his likeness? Unless we obtain a knowledge of him. It is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is why he came into the world to reveal it unto us. It goes on to say, brothers and sisters, it is by beholding that we become changed. It is by beholding that we become changed, by dwelling upon the love of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, by contemplating the perfection of his divine character and claiming the righteousness of Jesus Christ as our own by faith, we are to be transformed into the same image. So how are we transformed? How are we changed? By beholding Jesus Christ, the man. Let's pray. Precious Jesus, we are here today to worship you. Oh, Jesus, you are our creator. Please, Lord, create new life in us. Create new hearts, new minds, new way of seeing the world around us. People, create us anew, dear Jesus. We thank you that you can do this that you promise to do this as we continue to come to you. Jesus, we're here to worship you as the man, to behold you, not only as our creator, but as our redeemer, the one who purchased us by your own blood. Please, Lord, help us to give ourselves without reservation to your ownership. And Lord, we behold you as the life and the resurrection. Please, Lord, help us to have courage and hope in your wonderful power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we have no fear of the devil, that perfect love cast out all fear, fear of death, fear of anything. And Lord, we worship you as our intercessor, the one who stands in praise on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. And we worship you, dear Jesus, as our soon coming king. Please, Jesus, help us to behold you more readily, more frequently. Help us to see our desperate need to behold you more constantly. And all of your people said, amen and amen. <clears throat> At this time, we're going to part company, and we're going to take part in the ordinance of humility, the foot washing service. Just a little bit of uh, logistical instruction um, the, the men will be upstairs in Central Hall. The couples will be um, upstairs here in the church in um, the young adult classroom, and then the, uh, there's another room right next to it. And then the ladies will be downstairs in Central Hall. Okay? So, and then the young people, if children would like to stay here, Dolly is going to share stories with the, the children. So after we wash each other's feet, we're going to come back and we'll take part in the communion emblems.